Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike. I'm the American Analyst. And we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. As you'll no doubt notice, my beautiful face is not on your screen today. It's because we're going to be doing something uh, a bit longer, a bit longer form video today. The New York Times Magazine has recently done a live stream of their second annual 1619 project. I suppose you would call it a conference. Symposium, perhaps. And I wanted to go through it. So I'm going to be watching this live. I have not yet watched it. It's an hour and 50 minutes long. Do not worry. I will be editing out some of the parts, but I strongly recommend that you all uh, watch the entire length of video because uh, that way you know I'm not taking anyone out of context. With that being said, I wanted to first give some context. I will not be giving my thoughts at this point. I will save that for the end of the video. The 1619 Project is by the New York Times Magazine, so not the newspaper, the magazine. The New York Times Magazine and it is essentially a way to reframe the founding narrative of our nation. I believe that is a fair way to say it. Uh, the, the people who are in charge uh, of this project uh, believe that slavery has had a more foundational role in our nation than has been traditionally taught. So, with that being said, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones is the leader, the head, I, not necessarily writer, but the project leader of this particular effort by the New York Times Magazine. And without any further adieu, working on my French, let's get right into it. If you like what I do, please be sure to like this video subscribe to my channel, follow me on Twitter and Minds. And finally, if you like these longer form videos, please let me know. If you saw the runtime and thought to yourself, there's no way I'm watching that, also please let me know. That'll uh, give me some guidance as to what kind of content I should do in the future. At the end of the day, I'm gonna do what I want. <laughs> but certainly, I, I always appreciate everybody who watches and listens so if people really don't like these longer form videos i won't be doing them uh as frequently as i as i otherwise would so please let me know let's get into it Okay, here we go. We have the ma'am herself, along with one Mr. Silverstein, who's the New York Times Magazine's editor. And the ma'am would be Nicole Hannah-Jones. Let's see what they have to say about the 1619 Project. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out, for braving the snow, the rain, coronavirus, <laughs> all the things out there that could have stopped you. Um, well, thank you for just getting YouTube mad at me for mentioning the corona. We appreciate you coming out for what we think is going to be a really interesting and informative night. I'm Jake Silverstein. I'm the editor-in-chief of the New York Times Magazine. Thank you. Y'all definitely have to be the most nerdy people in New York. Because it is a Friday night. It's a Friday night. And you're coming here to hear a bunch of historians talk about the Revolutionary War. So I... I yes, but you're not a historian, are you? You're a journalist. I applaud you. I applaud you. <laughs> so I'm Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm a staff writer at... Told you. The New York Times Magazine. <laughs> Thank you. 
as some of you may know, um, about last... Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we are not at the Apollo right now. I'm going to need y'all to calm down. <laughs> I'll let you know later. <laughs> So last August, um, the New York Times, of course, produced a project to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans to the British North American colonies. And we gathered in this very room to launch that project as part of an ongoing initiative um, that aims to really reconsider and reframe history and the legacy of American slavery. The project was based in law. You could say it like that. I personally would say it was launched in order to take some very serious axe swings to the foundations of the United States. I mean, really think about it. If the revolution was not about freedom, freedom from Great Britain, wanting to form your own government, self-determination, what was it about? And why was it legitimate large part on recent scholarship into the history of slavery, which has dramatically deepened our understanding of this country's origins and our founding. And that's really what we hoped the project itself would do, to bring some of that scholarship to a wider audience and to show how the past continues to exert such a strong influence on the present. The project, as I'm sure many of you are aware It's a bit cliched, but he who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. Well aware has had an enormous impact and sparked a lot of important conversations about national identity and history. It's also led to some very fierce debates. A couple of months ago, we had some historians write a letter to the editor here at the, at the paper objecting to certain aspects of the project, including our interpretation of the role that slavery played in the causes and motivations of the American Revolution. This should be interesting. I know exactly what he's talking about. A group of historians several months ago, and even more recently, back in February, wrote a letter here to Mr. Silverstein stating that they believed that he was wrong about his interpretation, he being the New York Times Magazine and the 1619 Project, were wrong about their interpretation of the foundation of the United States and they did not back down. In fact, they doubled down, saying that no, these historians who wrote them were all wrong, and that the New York Times was right. We defended those characterizations, as did some other historians, but a vigorous argument and conversation has ensued in the, in the time since then. So tonight, we really hope to add more depth and clarity uh, to that conversation and to talk more about what our founding really was about. Uh, we've invited five way more eminent scholars. Just kidding. <laughs> we've invited five. Who was that directed towards? Is, was that directed to her boss? <laughs> uh, I guess <laughs> I, I assume it was directed at the scholars who wrote the times that would make more sense eminent scholars of early american history to discuss the relationship between slavery and the revolution and these historians are all engaged in active primary research into this era and in a moment we're going to turn the stage over to them before we do i want to uh, thank one of those scholars in particular tonight's moderator Karen Wolf. Karen is a professor of history at William and Mary and the executive director of the Amohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. The Amohundro Institute is the nation's oldest organization devoted to advancing, publishing, and promoting scholarship related to uh, early American history. And the OI also publishes a very influential journal, the William and Mary Quarterly. And they did a, a cool thing today, which is they put out a reading list uh, of. Uh, oh, great. Homework. Uh, articles from the last five decades or so from the Quarterly's archives that relate to the topic of tonight's conversation. So if any of you are interested in exploring this topic further after the, the discussion tonight, that would be a good place to start. And in the New York Times Magazine's Twitter feed, you can find a link to that, uh, to that reading list. So that's, a, that's one thing to do this weekend if this is not enough for you tonight. <laughs> 
I will say that's a good idea, despite my sarcastic comment. I, I would like to know more about this topic, and I do intend on reading that. So, Omendaro Institute, I suppose we'll see what it is that you're cooking up. Well, that wasn't on your card, so I didn't realize it was my cue. <laughs> <laughs> Could you not memorize this? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we, of course, want you all to have an opportunity to take part in this conversation as well. So there will be a brief Q&A at the end. Please submit your questions by emailing questions at nytimes.com during the... I love that. I love this. Wouldn't want any errant questions. Wouldn't want any rogues coming up with the surprise questions. So you go ahead and email them. And we'll check them for you. Don't worry. We'll make sure. We'll make sure the good ones get through. Program, and we will pick the best, most thoughtful questions. Um, and now, mm. please uh, help me welcome Karen Wolf to the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. So. So thank you so much to Jake and thank you so much to Nicole for inviting me to facilitate this important conversation and welcome. Welcome to you all. We're so glad to have you here with us. Very interested to see if they have any dissenting opinions. Tonight, before I introduce our distinguished panel, I wanted to offer some context for what we're trying to achieve here. Oh. This will be good. First, I want us all to acknowledge that history is extraordinarily compelling. The past is a compelling subject. Shakespeare wrote for The Tempest that what's past is prologue. And yes, inarguably, the past is the context for the present. But history is actually more than context, more than prologue. History is predicate. What we understand of our history is the foundation for how we explain the present and the justification the rationale for how we plan for the future. What? <laughs> they literally just, I just said, the quote I said earlier was from George Orwell, and it's about an authoritarian regime. She just said that. <laughs> she, I mean, she's using very fancy words. I'll put, I'll give it to her. You're using fancy words to try to confuse, confuse people. But all you just said, all you just said was he who controls the present controls the past. He con who controls the past controls the future. That's all you just said. That's it. This sense of history's consequence is what makes history not only compelling, but very, very powerful. Artists and writers, including journalists, shed light on the present by exploring the past. For research historians, however, the work of history is somewhat different. It is at once both process and product. Historians recover the past by immersing themselves in primary sources, by embedding their work within the writing of other historians, and by sharing their work for feedback. Scholarship is peer reviewed before publication, meaning that it is read and commented on by other experts. And this is how historical scholarship develops, through an ongoing professional conversation about what we know and how we know it. This is also the process that creates so-called revisionist history. To borrow an observation from my friend, the great Civil War historian. I think this is going to be really good. This is going to be, I'm so glad that I did this. This is, let me tell you something about quote unquote revisionist history. And she, her and I actually may be on the same page. I, I, as I said, I haven't seen this. Um, so, and I, she, I suspect we actually may be on the same page. All historians do revisionist history. They all do. The point of researching history is to find something new and to then thereby change our perception of the thing. My criticism of the 1619 project is not that they are doing that they're trying to bring to light new information my criticism is that they're wrong but we'll see what she has to say and i should have started revisionist history is what some people would say like if you had always thought that 
a dog has four legs. It's just an example. And then someone comes with you, comes to you and says, <clears throat> and says, no, actually, I, I found this uh, article, this photo of a dog from 100 years ago that only had three legs. And then that other person would turn around and say, you're a revisionist. You're a revisionist. You're a revisionist. You don't know. That's never happened. You're trying to rewrite the past. And it's like, no. No, no, you're trying to bring new information to light. And again, we may be on the same page on, on this particular point. At Ayers, we are all in favor of revisionist medicine. Are we not? I think so. Medical research advances through new information, new methods, and new perspectives. For example, just in the last decades, we know that cardiac research proceeded with an overwhelmingly male pool of research subjects. Even Spare me. Even though cardiovascular research remains a leading cause of death for women, obviously we need to study women too. It's a... I know the point you're trying to make, Ms. Wolf. It's the leading cause for men too. Why are you bringing this up? Why frame it in this... For another example, there are important racial disparities in medicine. Spare me. From pain management to maternal health. And obviously, we need to study why that is. In short, new information, new methods, new perspectives, new work to be done. And just as our understanding of human, his of human health is being continually revised through research and study, through information, methods, and perspectives, human history is also newly revised through research and study. And I believe... Okay, we agree. Uh, like I said, I thought that's what she was going to say. And I completely, completely agree. The For the history buffs out there, uh, many of you may know that when the Soviet archives opened up after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, it turns out there were a lot of things that we assumed about the Soviet-German conflict in the Second World War that were actually false. We assume that the Soviets were essentially bunglers who only won because they had more people. When it appears that that is not even close to the case, they ended up beating the Germans because they were better. In the end. Obviously. Obviously not at the beginning. So we agree on this. Just why frame it like this? Like, it, it, it's like medical doctors uh, are mostly men. What? <laughs> I believe that making this process transparent, sharing with you in particular right now, tonight, how historical interpretation develops and changes is as important as the information itself, particularly in this era of disinformation, in an era when information integrity is absolutely at a premium. Um, okay, I'm not going to do this a lot. I'm, I have to listen to this again. It's new perspectives, new work to be done. And just as our understanding of human, his of human health is being continually revised through research and study, through information, methods, and perspectives, human history is also newly revised through research and study. And I believe that making this process transparent, sharing with you in particular right now, tonight, how historical interpretation develops and changes is as important as the information itself. The... process transparent sharing with you in particular right now tonight how historical interpretation develops and changes how historical interpretation changes and develops is as important as the information itself ah okay okay i see what she's saying i see what she's saying so they're going to be going i get, i suppose into the process of history and how new information changes our understanding of past events. It, it, it was just framed poorly, I, I believe. Is as important as the information itself, particularly in this era of disinformation, in an era when information integrity is absolutely at a premium. It's important to share how we come to have the information and the knowledge that we have. Tonight... Any New York Times writers in the audience? <laughs> We're going to be talking about slavery and the American Revolution. Obviously, that's on your program. 
but we're also sharing an inside look at that process of historical scholarship. We'll be talking about evidence and analysis, how we come to consensus, if and when we do, and in what ways disagreement about the evidence, the analysis, and the conclusions are productive. Since the 19th century, black scholars in particular have been pointing to the essential contradiction of a revolution with liberty at its ambitious center, yet slavery as an institution protected in the course of the revolution and by the government born of it. And they have pointed to the role played by free and enslaved black people in that revolution. But up through the 1980s, scholars of the American Revolution largely focused on other aspects of the war and the politics of revolution. It's no coincidence that with a much more diverse historical profession, questions of race, slavery, and revolution have now come to the fore. As we look at this developing scholarship, I would say it's no question that with a more postmodern historical perspective that those issues she mentioned have has come to before to the fore on slavery and the American Revolution this evening, we'll be asking, what are the key events and issues that help us to understand this nexus of slavery and revolution? What are the historical sources that inform our analysis? How has our knowledge evolved? Where are continuing points of debate? And there is no mistaking the stakes of asking such questions about the American Revolution. They bear keenly on our understanding of the nation itself. Here is that fundamental question, which is what Nicole raised in her provocative New York Times Magazine essay. That was an excellent word. Provocative. Provocative. Not historical. Not interesting. Not worthy of study. Provocative. It was clickbait. Of what was America born and what legacies has the nation inherited? Historians, I must note, primarily historians who don't do primary research, either in slavery or in the colonial and revolutionary era, otherwise known as people who don't know what they're talking about, have been much more publicly debating the implications of rooting the revolution in a narrative about slavery rather than a narrative about liberty. For tonight, we're hoping to shed more light than heat on this subject, though I'm confident there'll be I doubt that. a little heat, too. I've been told not to use the word historiography, but I must tell you I cannot resist. I already used it. <laughs> For you New Yorkers who are out here on a Friday night to talk about history, slavery, and the American Revolution, and the wonderful, insightful process of historical discovery, historiography is that secondary scholarship that results from that process of inquiry. So historiography, it's going to be lit. That's my feeling. <laughs> we are going to try hard not to get too mired in too much detail or to treat important issues as abstractions. Yeah, we wouldn't want to muddy the narrative with details. Both tempting tendencies when you get a group of historians who really know their stuff on the stage. But we are going to work hard. We know that this evening is not for us. It's actually for you. Fair enough. I, I shouldn't be so vitriolic uh, towards this particular person. We're excited about this opportunity. We're very grateful to the New York Times and to the 1619 Project for recognizing the value of the past and also for recognizing the value of the ways that historical research informs us all. So let me introduce... I don't think they do. That's why I said I, I shouldn't be so vitriolic towards this person. I think she does care about history and about getting it right. I just think she's wrong. I don't think the New York Times and the 1619 Project actually does care about it. Okay, we are going to leave it there for now. I have decided to break this up into several different parts. So please tune in next Sunday for part two. They're just about to bring out the panel, which will really get into the guts of the history that they are trying to discuss. And I had realized that in order to do a proper rebuttal of some of these ideas, 
I'm going to need a significant, significantly more time to do that. So once again, please tune in next Sunday for part two. If you like what I do, please be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, follow me on Twitter and Minds. Have a good evening. Thank you all for listening. This is Mike, the American Analyst. Follow me on Twitter, Minds, and subscribe to me on YouTube. And be sure to hit that bell notification. I'll be coming out with new videos every single day for your viewing enjoyment. Have a good one.